today's reading from 1 Corinthians 6, 12 through 20. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food, but God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immortality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Now God has not only raised the Lord, but also, but will also raise us up through his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? May it not may it never be. Or do you not know that one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? <clears throat> For he says, the two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immortality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immortal man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not, are not your own? For you have been brought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his holy word. You know, um, in life I find that there are certain things that you can continue to admire and appreciate in your entire life if you take the time to, to really do so. Um, for example, I, I was born and raised in Philly, and at nighttime when we would look up into the sky, honestly, if you saw three stars, it was a, it was a good night. And there are nights still here, you know, however many years later, um, that I go outside and just stop and stand there and marvel at, at the beauty of the sky and God's creation. I still do that to this day. I hope that you uh, take time to do that too. One of the other things that, that, that I marvel at every time I see is the beauty of a rainbow. Every single time a rainbow comes out, I feel like a little kid, you know, just having to pull over to the side of the road just to, uh, to look at it. Um, there are certain things in life that you are constantly marveled by and amazed by and take time to appreciate. I hope that you have those things. Um, I'm constantly amazed uh, by my children. Um, and I, not just in a bad way, they do amaze me like that too, but in, the, in a caring way. They, they are a caring group of kids, and I really appreciate that. Um, I still, and, and I'm being honest with you right now, I still take time weekly to ponder how a schmuck like me married, just married, managed to marry someone so beautiful. Um, and I say that in all honesty, that's your only nice one you're going to get the whole year. <laughs> but I'm afraid sometimes when I tell jokes up here from the front that you don't understand how I really feel. I, I feel like I'm the luckiest man in the world. Um, and these are just a, a few of the things that, that, that I take the time to ponder. But to be honest with you, to be completely honest with you, these things are the exception. They're the exception, not the rule. Because generally, as a rule, I find that the more we become exposed to something, whether good or bad, the more it becomes part of everyday life and just becomes something that we take for granted. I, I know that you've experienced this. And today I want to talk to you about one of those things as Christians that we take for granted and see if we might be able to notice it again instead of walking right by. So let's start with work there. Dear God, we thank you for today. We thank you for this moment, for this time. Help us to be in this moment, God. Help us to hear your scripture, your truths, and help us to apply it to our own lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. When we come to today's scripture, we find Paul writing to the church in Corinth again. We were there just last week, which is great, but now we're three chapters um, in. And once again, just like we saw last week, he is addressing something that the church there has um, completely misunderstood and is just getting themselves into trouble. And that's why in verse 12, he actually starts this section by using their argument. He's starting with their argument and then addressing it. And that's uh, when he talks, Paul is quoting them when he says, depending on what verse you read, uh, I'm going to quote out of the NIV, he says, 
everything is permissible for me. So he's saying, this is what you said, everything is permissible for me. And then he responds, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food for the stomach and stomach for the food, but God will destroy them both. And, and when you look at this section, you can see that Paul is, is uh, telling you what the problem is. Paul is quoting them. They were saying, everything is permissible for me. I can do anything. Everything uh, is lawful for me. You know, I can do whatever I want to do. And Paul responds with, yeah, not everything is beneficial. Not everything is beneficial. And it's followed up uh, with him quoting them saying, food for the stomach and stomach for the food. And then Paul responds, God's going to destroy them both. He's going to destroy them both. So Paul is addressing some kind of statement that the church in Corinth was using to justify some of their behaviors. But see, he's not very um, explicit in what he is saying here, um, uh, what, what they mean by saying everything is permissible and food for the stomach and stomach for the food. So let me start off by explaining to you what precisely was happening in the church in Corinth so that you can then understand, okay, this is what he was saying. Yet, <laughs> See, the people in the church of Corinth had de developed this interesting attitude and argument that said, as a Christian, I'm saved by grace, right? I mean, that's what you told me. So, I can do anything I want to do. I'm saved by grace, so I can do whatever I want to do because I don't have to get to heaven by doing this good stuff anymore. Um, and here's how this came about. Remember, in the Old Testament, the Jews were not allowed to eat certain kinds of food. One of those kinds of food that they were not allowed to eat was pork. Um, they weren't allowed to eat any sort of pig. They missed out on bacon. Can you imagine what life was like back then? Not worth living, if you ask me. Um, but this is one of the things that they were not allowed to eat any kind of, uh, uh, of meat like that. And when Jesus died, God declared all meat to be clean. Uh, okay, all of that stuff was now declared to be clean. And he did this because, for multiple reasons, but one of the reasons was because it was symbolic. Because the Jew and the Gentile were no longer separate. They, they no longer had these things to separate them, but they were united as one family now in God through Jesus Christ. Um, so people like Paul and Peter were going around telling people the truth, saying, listen, everything is, is now clean. There's nothing unclean. You don't have to worry about that anymore. You can eat whatever you want. So the people in Corinth heard this. They were like, well, yeah, everything is clean. And you mean I can do whatever I want? And they decided they were going to take it one step further past food. And they said, hey, if I can eat anything I want, that means the stuff that I put inside my stomach, then it doesn't affect me spiritually, right? Okay, so you said that it doesn't affect me spiritually. Then it only makes sense that the stuff that I do outside to my body as well then it shouldn't affect it either. I mean, logically, that makes sense. Um, and this means then, this is what the, the conclusion that they drew, that we should be able to do anything that we want to, including, I don't know, having relations with prostitutes. And, and that's what they were doing. That This is what they were doing. And this is why Paul specifically, he starts with that little, everything is, is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. And then at the very end of the, the, this section, he goes into that very, uh, you know, uh, explicit description of, here's where you're trying to take it, and this is ridiculous. Um, but the people in, in Corinth had adopted the attitude that their bodies were their own, and since they were their own, they could do whatever they wanted to do with them. It's my body. It's my choice. Absolutely. Sound familiar? Sounds like they could live however they wanted to live and could do whatever they wanted to do because it's their life. It's my life. It's my body. And nobody, nobody had the right to tell them otherwise. Not even God himself. Not even God himself. It's absolutely ridiculous. And, and honestly, when I started uh, working on this extra scripture, I didn't plan on taking the rest of it to where I feel God led me to. But, but when I started thinking about it, praying about it, this is precisely where God took me with this section. Have you ever heard before the, the phrase sanctity of life? You ever heard the phrase sanctity of life? You know what that means? It means that all life was created by God and therefore all life, all life is sacred or holy and is to be set apart for his purposes. God created you for his purpose, for you to accomplish his good will. Your life was sanctified. Do you understand what that means? You understand what that means to be sanctified? That all life is sanctified? 
You see, as a society, we have made it a declaration that people are nothing more than a conglomeration of cells and that bodies are not to be treated as sacred. And when we do that, we, that, that gives us a justification that says we can do whatever we want to our own bodies because they're our own bodies and we don't have to feel guilty about it. I mean, we don't have to feel guilty about doing that. And the result of that is not only us doing terrible things to our own bodies, but at the same time, it's also to the bodies of others. Because if we're not sanctified, then nobody's sanctified. We're just a bunch of selves. And this has been a problem for a long time. And let me tell you, let, let me tell you how this has been a problem for a long time. Because the Old Testament talks specifically about this. In the Old Testament, you'll read about a false god called Molech. Anybody ever heard of Molech before? Um, he, he was a false god in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 32, 35 talks about him. It says this, They built high places of Baal that are in the valley of Ben-Hinnom to cause their sons and daughters to pass through the fire to Molech, which I had not commanded them, nor had it, it entered my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. Okay, so listen up. This is important for you to understand what was happening back then. Um, back in the Old Testament time, they had made up a false god, and this false god's name was Molech. He had the body of a human, the head of a bull. And one of the, the, the most famous statues to him, <coughs> idols, that they would go up to worship was a giant statue of him with his hands out like this. And then under his hand sat a bull. And people would come to this god, and they would build a fire in this bull. And they'd get this fire so hot that, that, that the hands would actually turn red themselves from the heat. And then, while that hand was burning hot, while, while, while the, the flames were going high, they would then take their firstborn baby, they would place it on those hands, and they would stand there and watch the baby burn to death. That's what they would do. This is the sacrifice that they would make to Molech. And not only were, were the, the people who didn't believe in God doing it, but now God's followers themselves were sacrificing children in this way to Molech, standing there. And watching the firstborn burn to death. Burn to death. And you might say, how can anybody do such a thing? How could they do such a thing? And the answer is, is because they did not believe that all lives were saved. They did not believe that all lives were sanctified. And instead of believing in the sanctity of life, they simply believed in a conglomeration of selves. Don't tell me that we don't believe the same thing today. I just talked with Consistory about this um, on Monday and right before that I talked with uh, my Sunday school class uh, about this last week. The Jews, and some of you are going to be surprised, but some of you may be. Did you know that there are over 3,700 babies aborted every single day in the United States? 3,700 abortions every single day in the United States. Worldwide, every single day, 365 days a year. There are 115,000 abortions per day. Per day, 115,000. That's 42 million babies every single year. 42 million. And why do we allow it? Why do we allow it? Because it's the woman's body. And she can do whatever she wants to with it. I mean, that, that's the excuse that we say, right? It's just a conglomeration of cells. It's not a sanctified life. It's not real. And it doesn't stop there. I mean, the, the, the movement of taking away all sanctification from, from human bodies doesn't end there. You've all heard of wrongful death suits, right? When someone has died, there was something wrong with that situation, so you come up with a lawsuit. Have you heard of wrongful birth lawsuits? Because those exist too. Wrongful birth lawsuits. In 2012 in Oregon, for example, the Levy family, um, they sued their health care providers for not providing them with the information or finding out that their child, their baby girl, was going to be born with Down syndrome. And they argued that if they had known ahead of time that they were going to have a baby with Down syndrome, that they would have aborted her. And the fact that she was born gives them the right to sue these companies because they did not have their God-given right to kill this child. And now they're stuck with her. They're stuck with her. You know, these people should have been slapped when they came into that courtroom and sent right back out. That's what it should have happened. But instead, they were awarded $2.9 million. $2.9 million because they didn't have the right to kill their own child. 
2013 in Washington, a similar case um, where a child was born this time with a genetic defect, was awarded $15 million because they did not have a fair chance to terminate the life of their child beforehand, and now they had to deal with, with this sick child afterwards. If that wasn't bad enough, in Canada around that same time in 2013, there was a woman who was facing charges. She was 19 year old. She gave birth to, to a healthy baby, which she then strangled and took it and threw it over the fence into her neighbor's yard. The judge in this case said that she saw no real difference between this and abortion. She let the mom go free. The mom faced no jail time whatsoever. The mom was in prison for 16 days, and the judge apologized for it. She said she was sorry that the court system treated her like this. I mean, it continues to go on, people. You, you have to understand that there's a pattern. There was an article published in the Journal of Medical Ethics. This is where doctors come together and talk about the, the ethics, the ethics of our medicine. And there were a handful of authors who argued that, that parents should be able to kill their children shortly after they were born. You see, children are born with the potential for life, not the right to live. Those are completely different. And they said, especially if you live in a country where abortion is not accessible or not affordable, <coughs> then you should be able to abort them after they're born without it being considered murder. After all, what's the real difference between killing a baby inside the mother or after it has come out? You know, there, that's the first thing that I actually agree with. I don't find a difference. Um, but I would argue for neither, not both. But we as a society no longer believe in the sanctity of life. We don't. Life is not sacred. Life is not holy. It's just something that's to be discarded to the side when its usefulness is over. And this attitude, this is what Paul is trying to specifically address, what he's trying to battle in the life of the church of Corinth and in our lives. And that's why verse 15 Paul says, do you not know that, you're, that your bodies are members of Christ himself? And in verse 19, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you receive from God? You are not your own, you are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. And he's telling us that our bodies belong to God. They are sacred. They are sanctified. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And with God living inside it, it should be treated as such. But we don't treat life as being sacred, do we? We don't even treat our own bodies as if they're sacred, let alone someone else's. In a society, we've lost all appreciation for the sanctity of life. If you need evidence, then, then go ahead and watch, watch some of the Planned Parenthood videos which show a government-funded agency keeping babies alive after aborting them so that they can harvest their living organs. And tell me, tell me that we still believe in the sanctity of life. Life is not sacred. And as Christians, this is just one of those things that we have been around for so long that, that we just kind of walk right by it. And it doesn't even impact us anymore like it should. And how should we be responding to this? Well, if you ask me, my personal opinion, we should be sad. We should be hurting. We should be enraged. We should be fighting for all life to be treated as something special. Mine, yours, ours, and those who cannot uh, fight for themselves. But in some cases as Christians, we have done the exact opposite of what we have been doing. Instead of treating for life to be special, we instead have turned a blind eye to the blatant disregard for life. Did you know that 80% of women receiving abortions in the United States identify themselves as being Christians? That's 8 out of 10 say that they are followers of Christ. And you know, what? if you were one of these ladies, then I want you to know it's okay. It's okay. God forgives everything. Unconditionally. No matter what. If you ask for it. It's okay. And the sad truth is, is that part of the reasons... That these numbers are so high and that people feel, people feel drawn to these. Because is, as Christians, we are so judgmental of one another that some people would rather murder a child than have to deal with the lifelong stares and whispers of their fellow Christians critiquing their lifestyles. And that is the God's honest truth. Folks, all life is sacred. All life is sanctified. And I don't care. I don't care whether it was in wedlock or out of wedlock. 
I don't care whether it was from a 40-year-old woman or from a teenager. All life is sacred and needs to be treated as such. 35,600,000 babies have died so far this year from abortion. I'm just, I'm just asking you, you. You tell me. Don't you think it's time that we stop walking right by as if nothing is happening? Don't you think it's time that we say we're not used to this and we're not okay with it? Don't you think it's time that we once again declare all life is being sanctified and sacred? Don't you feel like it's time that we stop being so judgmental that we encourage people to do this just to avoid our stares? Folks, Molech has had enough sacrifices while we stood by and watched. And I'm just asking us, as Christians, to begin to open our eyes first so that the rest of the world can, can also see all life is sacred. All life is sanctified. Let us treat it as such. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for your scripture, which just makes it so evidently clear, God, that all life is to be able to, is to be treated as special, as sanctified, God, as created by you for a purpose. And we apologize that as Christians we've turned a blind eye to this, God. Help us once again to, to emotionally connect to this thing, God. Just allow us to be your servants in this situation and do whatever you ask us to do as an individual. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.